Today's video is about energy work and power for the mechanics section of A-level physics. And it appears like we're doing a lot of specification references in here, 25 to 30 for A-level and 17 to 22 for IAL. We are covering, as you can see, a lot of those, and many of those are ones that you have covered already at GCSE. So I'll be going pretty quickly through those parts. However, there are bits and pieces that are just a little bit extra for A-level, and I'm going to point those out to you as we go along. For example, at GCSE, we do work done along a line on a single plane, and here we have to also consider uh, situations where the force is not along the line of motion, and we'll be talking about that later on. Also, the uh, gravitational potential energy equation, they do emphasize that it's near the Earth's surface and that's important. And then the rest of it is pretty similar to what you've had before. So a quick run through and then I will point out any areas where you need to really think about it. Okay, energy. So we already know from GCSE that we have a number of stores of energy and that it can be transferred from one store to another in specific ways. Now. They were fairly forgiving about the language that you use for the first couple of years for A-level, but they are going to get stricter about this, so you need to make sure that you're using the correct language for these things. What are those stores and transfers? Well, here are the stores down along the left-hand side. You'll notice that electrical energy, what used to be called electrical energy, is not one of them. We do have electrostatic as a store of energy. That's for charges that are brought close together. And therefore, let's say two positive charges, they repel each other, it's a type of electrostatic. But electrical energy has disappeared off here. Instead, we move the energy from one of these stores to another using these transfers, and you'll notice electricity is in there. But the one that we're most concerned about this in this section is using a force. So transfers, what used to be called mechanical transfers, they're now called transfers by a force and also known as work being done. We know, of course, when work is done, that energy is transferred. And so the amount of work done is measured in joules and should be the exact same amount as the amount of energy transferred. So we use the letters W and E fairly interchangeably through here, although strictly work done is that that is done by a force. We also know from GCSE that work done is the force times the distance moved in the direction of the force. And this was a very important definition for GCSE. We didn't really pay any attention to it at the time, but we are going to pay attention to it now. And the reason we're going to do that is because we now are able to calculate using forces in two planes. So not just the horizontal plane and the vertical plane, but also between those two planes, like it's shown in the diagrams here. So the work that's done could be the size of the force in the direction of the movement, which might not be the entire force, it could be the horizontal component of the force or the vertical component of the force, times that the distance moved there. Or it could be the size of the force and the component of the displacement in this case that is in the direction of the force. So if we look at these three diagrams down here, it gives you a good idea. Here's diagram number one. So suppose you're pulling on a rope along here and this box slides this distance s in that direction. Now obviously this force has both a vertical component and a horizontal component because you're not just pulling it along the table, you're pulling it slightly up and along, which means that you could not find the work done by just multiplying the size of that force by the distance because that is not the force that is pulling it horizontally. So option number one is to find out how much of that force is pulling horizontally and then multiply that by s. In other words, this, our original force was there, and there was our angle theta, which means that this side, the horizontal side, is the force F cos theta. If you don't know why that is, go back to my vectors and scalars video and have a little watch through it, and then come back and look at this. So now that we know the size of the force that is in the direction of the displacement, we can just go, the work done would be F cos theta s. There's another way of looking at this. You could find out how much of this displacement s, remember that was our s down there, how much of that is in the direction of the force by making a triangle out of with this s being the hypotenuse of that triangle. And again, you'll find 
if that's the hypotenuse of the triangle, this side in the direction of the force is going to be s cos theta, which means our work done would then be f s cos theta, which is exactly the same as we had before, just with a slightly different arrangement of where the cos theta is. So either one works depending on what it feels intuitive in the situation at the time. Now remember, of course, that it's cos theta if that's the angle that you know. If it's another angle that you're given, then you have to figure out what this theta is so that you can apply this equation. Now, let's talk about calculating energy, energy transfers, and conservation of energy. The principle of conservation of energy is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. This is what we know already. Remember, we are using the terminology store now instead of perhaps what you might have used before, which is form. You have to be a bit careful about whether your system is isolated or not. An isolated system, you get energy transfers occurring and none of it is lost to the surroundings. In reality, of course, systems are not generally isolated. There are always some form of transfers to the outside, usually waste energy as thermal energy. Now, if we want to calculate kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, we know these equations already. You don't have to remember these equations, unlike at GCSE because they are given to you in the data book that you're given with your A-level. However, it's much faster and easier if you know them already, and of course you do know them already from GCSE. Um, gravitational potential energy, it must be emphasized that this G is only valid near the surface of the Earth. We will be pro progressing to calculating a form of gravitational energy when we do the gravitation section, where we have to sort of forget about this MGH and go back to the roots of where gravitational potential energy comes from. But for now, we will assume that any of our calculations that we're doing are close to the surface of the Earth, and you can just go ahead and use G as 9.81. Transfers between GPE and KE are specifically mentioned in our specification, so it's worth bringing them up here. There are lots of situations where an object is above the Earth in its gravitational field and starts to fall, and of course its gravitational potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy. So a swing or a pendulum is a perfect example of this. It loses GPE and is speeding up and gaining kinetic energy. And at the lowest point of the swing, that starts to switch back. Now, of course, this isn't a closed system because there is work being done up against resistive forces, but we will come to that in a moment. Another classic example is a bouncing ball. As the, the ball goes through its bounces, it loses height each bounce because each time you're getting energy being transferred, not just to resistive forces as it moves through the air, air resistance in other words, but also, of course, every time it hits the ground, it is losing energy to the ground as thermal energy, either straight through heating by a friction or perhaps using sound to transfer the thermal energy to the air. So there are a lot of possible stores and transfers that you could be asked to discuss Remember, you have to use the right terminology if you're going to do that. Final example, slides and ramps. You have a person at the top of the slide has GPE, and when it slides down, you lose GPE, remembering that, of course, you were going to lose energy to resistive forces on the way down. Roller coasters are another favorite. Uh, toys, toy cars on ramps, things like that. There are so many situations, it's impossible to cover them all. But the principle, of course, is the same each time you have mgh is equal to half mv squared, assuming that no energy is lost. And of course, you can take out those m's, meaning gh is equal to a half v squared. Now again, remember, although it looks like we might be losing energy in this, the law of conservation of energy, or the principle of conservation of energy, always applies. There are no situations where it does not apply. Because although it appears that you're losing energy because eventually the ball stops bouncing, that energy is simply being transferred into other stores. So there should no, not be any situation where you answer a question and say, the principle of conservation of energy does not apply here, because it always does. What happens, of course, is work is being done against resistive forces. So anytime you see forces being involved, you know that the way the transfer is happening is through work done. Now, let's talk a little bit about power. Power is the rate of energy transfer. 
it's a much more useful concept because energy is sort of a total amount. It doesn't give you any idea of the time period over which that amount of energy became was transferred, and therefore it doesn't really give you a picture of what is happening. Power is a much more useful thing. It is obviously measured in watts, which we should know already from GCSE, and we also know this equation. Energy transferred, or of course work done, so you can use any energy equation up here. It could be half mv squared, it could be mgh if you're trying to find out how much energy was transferred, or you can go ahead and put in force times distance moved in the direction of the force in there. But over the time it takes to do that, and we of course have two equations for this, energy over time or work over time. Again, these are very familiar from GCSE, hopefully. There is a nice little derivation that goes with this though. Um, if you take work done is equal to force times distance and you put it, substitute it in there, you end up with P is equal to Fs over T. Um, and separating that out, F on S over T, and of course S over T is velocity. So you can find the power of a moving object by the force times its velocity. Now, you can't go ahead and just use this equation any time you want in an A-level calculation, though, because it is not given on our data book. And this is something that students sometimes find difficult to comprehend. If you are asked to do a calculation in, our, in an exam question, you have to start from the equations that are given in the data book, even if you have at your disposal, like this, other equations that could do the job faster. Because what they don't want is people just learning off reams and reams of, of equations and then just plucking them out of the air and not really understanding what they're doing with them. So they want you to start from the data book and work from there. Finally, efficiency. Efficiency, as we know, is a measure of how much of the energy we put into a device is usefully transferred, and it's the same equations as we had before. Generally, I would leave these as a decimal rather than transferring them into a percentage. A percentage is a nice friendly thing at GCSE because everyone understands what it means to be 50% efficient, but actually it's more useful for calculations if you just leave it as a, as a decimal. You can calculate efficiency with either energy or you can do it with power. It's the same equation. That is a very quick fly through energy. I will be doing energy questions in another video some of which will be available on my Patreon page, some on uh, YouTube, so please do check them out. The questions can get tricky from time to time, but most of the time they're actually straightforward, get maximum marks questions.